Hey everybody, welcome back to Unapologetically Woman. This year we're celebrating phenomenal women all across Kentucky who make no apologies for their perspectives or the impacts that they're making in the community. Today we're celebrating Roz Aikens. Roz is the founder of the BMW program, co-founder of the Carter G. Woodson Academy, and preacher at Bracktown Baptist Church. Roz is a mentor and a fearless advocate for educational opportunities, equity, and strengthening the community for all. Unapologetically woman, Roz Aikens, that's you. Thank you so very much. I'm so honored and humbled to be here today. Well, I'm so glad to be able to celebrate you. I'm going to start off by okay. reading something that someone said and getting your thoughts about it. Okay. This is one of your former students. She is a busy woman because she is about her business. She's going to be in your business <laughs> and she's going to be about her father's business. <laughs> How does it make you feel when you hear a former student refer to you that way? Um, very humbled. Uh, you know, one of the great things about what I do is I'm walking in my calling and my purpose. And my calling um, and my purpose is in helping young people, in particularly males of color. Uh, and so I've been in education. This is my 42nd year Woo! celebrating as an educator here in the Fayette County Public School System. I actually retired in 2004. Uh, because we were about to build a new church and I wanted to help my husband uh, during that time. And so I, I actually retired in December, but that retirement was short lived. Bless my husband's heart. He thought he was going to get breakfast every morning and, you know, three meals a day. But a uh, hundred days after retiring, <laughs> uh, the Fayette County School System called me back to a school uh, whose principal left suddenly. And so I came back uh, to that particular middle school. And when I got there, uh, the young men that were always in the office were African-American males, had the lowest test scores, were not performing well, well had no self-esteem, and it really bothered me. Uh, and I said, we've got to do something. We've got to make a difference to help these young people. And so uh, I went to two other members of my church, uh, Dr. Roger Cleveland, and at that time, Miss Janae Lane. And I said, listen, you guys, y'all got to help me. We got to do something to help some young men uh, at this particular middle school. And this middle school had 106 African-American males enrolled. And so um, we wrote a letter. Uh, to their parents who came up with that, this idea of starting a Saturday program called BMW, Black mm -hmm. Males Working, uh, to teach them that with your head and your hands and with your intelligence, you can be anything that you want to be. And so uh, I sent this wonderful letter to all the parents. Dear parent, please partner with us as we start this Saturday program to academically enhance your young man, socially and emotionally help them to develop and so at my first meeting, I had 10 people. Okay. So I decided. I don't to believe you gave up. No, I didn't. I wrote a second letter. Dear parent, <laughs> I don't understand why you did not attend the meeting last Thursday. <laughs> and I had 15 at the second meeting. So then we wrote a third letter. Dear parent, I don't understand why you don't love your son enough that you would not want him in this program. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in the words Heavy of Malcolm, hitter. that's right. In the words of Malcolm X, by any means necessary. So ended up with 40 young men. And our mission is to educate, motivate, and activate the potential for excellence that lies within every African-American male. What I know is this, it's in them. They just need to meet the right person and put them in the right environment so they can believe that they can succeed. And that's what we've been doing now for 16 years. Yeah. 16 successful years. We, yes. But that's not all you've been doing. <laughs> Talk to me about Carter G. Well. Uh, so after doing BMW for uh, several years, in 2010, uh, our superintendent at that time, Mr. Stu Silberman, came to me and said, Roz, let's do a data study to see if what you're doing on Saturday is making a difference. I said, I know it's making a difference. I get all the report cards. Grades are increasing. Behavior is much better. Uh, we're doing all of these great things. We're teaching them the well principles. They're to be well behaved, well mannered. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. Those are not old fogey terms. Those are ways that can open doors for you. They're to be well dressed, well -read because readers are leaders, well-spoken, well-traveled, and all of that leads to being well-prepared. And so he said, okay, but we still need data. So I said, okay. 
So data. they did, yeah, data, <laughs> data says it all. And so they did a data study, and when the data came back, uh, it showed that the African-American males who were coming to us were outperforming other African-American males. In mathematics, uh, it was 36 percent higher. Uh, in reading, 24 percent higher on standardized tests. But the big indicator was the ACT exam. The average ACT score for African-American males in 2010 was 15.8. Um, Our average ACT score was 22.4. That's what I'm so talking about. He made a big mistake. He said, Roz, what can I do to help you? And I said, well, Mr. Silberman, I said, give us these young men every day of the week, plus I'll continue to do BMW on Saturday. And he kind of looked like uh, the young man on different strokes. What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> and so I said, listen, when Toyota came here, you know, many years ago, we accommodated them because going to school was Six days a week was a part of their culture. Why can't we do the same for these young men and making a difference in their lives? So he went back to the school board. We made a presentation. And in 2010, Fayette County Public Schools voted to start the first all-male college prep school for boys in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And we named it the Carter G. Woodson Academy because of the connection of Berea College. Carter G. Woodson went to Berea College, and he is also the second African-American uh, ever to get a Ph.D. degree from Harvard University. So we had that you know, father of black history. So we got to name it. And now we're going, we opened in 2012. And so this is 2021 and we're getting ready to have our ninth uh, incoming class. And I'm even more excited to announce that this year we're going to open an elementary school. Where's that going to be? The elementary school is going to be at the old Johnson over on sixth street. So it will start with kindergarten first and second, and then progress every year and add a grade level. And so eventually the Carter G. Woodson Academy will go kindergarten through 12th grade. Wow, that's phenomenal. That's, We're excited. That's We're great so work. excited. But I'm going to tell you what, you don't fool around <laughs> in your advocacy and in your educational pursuits and, and helping these young men. You've got some tough standards for them to follow. Oh, definitely. As I said, that being well behaved and well mannered, well dressed, well spoken, uh, we have very high expectations and we believe that they can reach uh, those high expectations. I'll, I'll share a story with you. We take the boys on, uh, we start putting them on a college campus in the sixth grade. Uh, and the college that we go to is uh, in Nashville. We go to, we start at Tennessee State and Vanderbilt. And then we progress every year. So we've been all across the United States. So in 2010, I said to the boys, I said, listen, uh, I actually said in 2009, I said the 25 of you all that have the highest GPA are going to England, France, Germany, and Switzerland with me. And they said, we can't do that. We can't, you know, no, no, we can, how are we going to do that? Now, we can go on a bus anywhere in the United States and even fly a couple of places. But to go abroad, I said, you get the grades, we'll come up with the money. And so I had a young man who was sitting there, and he had like a 2.1, and he looked at me. He um, had not bought into the program yet. His mother drug him in on a Saturday. And so we noticed the next semester's grades went up. So when the time came for those top 25, this young man went from a 2.1 to a 3.8. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I said, oh, huh, you want to go? He said, you're not going to leave the country without me. <laughs> and so that's just an example of when you have those high expectations, mm -hmm. they can arise to those to those expectations. And so I've heard you say also um, somewhere that you were speaking and we were both in the same space that you want people to look at black young black black men and see potential and not wonder if they're athletes. Um, you told a story about that. You want yeah, to uh, one of the things that one of the stereotypes that we have to constantly deal with when we travel or take these young men places, first of all, they are very well dressed. And uh, that means all, jacket, yeah, patties, jacket, tie. Yeah, yeah, all of that. And um, I never will forget we were in uh, New York City um, and we were going to a Broadway play. And so they were all dressed in dress pants and nice shirts they had on bow ties. And every other individual as we were walking toward that, that's all they kept saying. What sports do you play? What, what, you know, what, what do you play? Football, basketball? And I get the grace joy saying this is an academic group. This is not about sports. 
And then while we were in Times Square, I had a, we had a professional photographer to come and take a picture of the boys because I wanted this to be a memorable occasion, them looking good, smelling good, you know, getting ready to go to Broadway. And a lady tapped me on the shoulder and asked me, when are they going to dance? Mm. And I said, beg your pardon? And she said, when are, when are they going to dance? And I said, ma'am, these young men are not dancers. I said, we're here on a cultural and academic trip. Well, they can still dance. I mean, she had not gotten a confrontation because mm. she wanted these 45 young, handsome African-American males to dance. And so one of the boys just finally had to pull me off the lady and said, ma'am, <laughs> we don't dance. And the sakers don't, you know. But that's the stereotype. So I tell them all the time, we are being ambassadors. Even as we travel abroad and travel all across the United States, you are an ambassador so that people will look at African-American males in a new light, in a new way, and to know that they're all not going to jail. They're not all, uh, you know, uh, thugs or those kinds of things. You are the new ambassadors. You are teaching that every African-American male can be somebody and are somebody. And so when you're working with, with the students, you're also working with the families because yes. you don't leave that out. What are some of the requirements and expectations that you have of, a pa of because I heard that reading, everybody, everybody in your program reads, not just the students, but that's the families right. too. We have, Dr. Cleveland started this great program called DEAR, Drop Everything and Read. Uh, as a matter of fact, since the second Saturday in uh, May, I've been meeting with every family and all the boys, reminding them of dear, drop everything and read. Reading is so important. And so what we tell the family is everybody stop, whether it, whatever time period you say, whether it's from 7 to 7.30, 6 to 6.30, we need everybody in the family to read because reading is so essential uh, in helping them to be successful on the ACT exam, to be successful in school. And so that's the expectation for the family that we do dear, drop everything and read. Okay, so outside of education, that's not all that you do. <laughs> You're also a preacher. Yes, I Talk am. Talk to me about that and how, what that role plays in everything that you do. Well, l let me say this. Um, I'm honored that God would choose me uh, for such a time as this uh, to preach his gospel. Um, and when, when you uh, have that opportunity uh, to share the word of God, you not only share it verbally, but you share it in the compassion and in the concern uh, that you have for these young men and their families. And, uh, and so that is an honor to be able to walk in your purpose that God is giving you, not only to verbally speak the word, but to live the word and how you treat these young folks, their people, their families and other people. So that's why I'm honored to be able to say that I am a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so how does that play when when you're thinking about what you want to do and you're planning with? Um, is that all? Well, I know that always has to be close to you. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, um, you know, we used to have that saying, what would Jesus do? Mm -hmm. And so that is always very part of what I do, you know, uh, not only with the boys, but anything that I do in life. I want it to reflect uh, who I am and my relationship to God. And so that's, you know, Jesus always talked about helping the least of these. And so when I look in terms of working with African-American males who the world sees as the least of these, I get to show the world that they are great young people and they have great potential. And so that's why I guess I, um, I have that ministry to African-American males, plus the fact I have five brothers. So mm. I believe that I was by growing up with boys, that I had that special, um, that God allowed me watching my brothers to grow up, to be able to interact with young men. You know, I know all the latest, I know who's playing and what games and football, <laughs> basketball, all of those kinds of things. And so you have to meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. And so that's a part of ministry, meeting people where they are and accepting them and then them seeing Christ in you, that that can make a change in their lives. I remember probably last April or mm -hmm. May, I was in a room with you and you were talking about the mayor's commission because mm -hmm. the last 13 months had been tough for it, everybody, yeah. especially with all of the reckoning with race that was going on. Yes. And before you accepted that appointment and that honor, you said, I prayed about this first. Yes. Talk about that. Yeah. Uh, when the mayor called, um, 
I'd only not only prayed about, you know, whether to be the co-chair for that commission, but I try, I pray about everything before I do it. Because one of the things you don't want to do is not be in the will of God. And so I ask God to, for his strength, his direction. Uh, there's a passage of scripture that says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all thy ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And so that's very much a part of who I am and wanting to please. God by, you know, him directing my path. So I prayed about that, uh, that assignment with the mayor's office. And then God revealed to me that this would be an opportunity to even expand and help to make life better. That's for the young people. You know, one of the things that's kind of disappointing, but at the same time, it's a reward, is when I see these young men graduate from college uh, and they go away and Many of them don't come back. Mm -hmm. And I want them to come back to Lexington. I want them to help make Lexington a better Lexington. You know, we invest all this time and energy in it, and they go to college, and then they go to Atlanta, they go to Charlotte, they go to these urban cities because they think they have a better opportunity. And so through this commission, hopefully we can make Lexington the place that they'll get an opportunity to come back and to give back to this city and make us those places of opportunity like a Charlotte, Atlanta, and all of those places where everybody is going to. What is your hope for the outcome of the work? I'm hoping that, first of all, all of the, uh, the implementation of all the recommendations. You worked so hard in education and economics uh, and, and law and, and justice, that, that area, all of those subcommittees, you all put time and work into that. So I, my prayer is that the recommendations will become implementation mm -hmm. and therefore it'll help make Lexington the better city that it should be. So I'm hoping the mayor's listening and that she will, you know, she has a team now that's working on the implementation, but we cannot lose sight of the implementation. Recommendations are great, but if but we don't implement them, we might right. as well have not done it. And so I'm hoping that, sh that we will show an appreciation for all the hard work of Dr. Smith and you and all those subcommittees by implementing all the things that came out of the commission. Roz, I heard that you make the best <laughs> wings in town. Now, is that is that faith Ab or fantasy? Absolutely truth. Or not? truth. <laughs> Ab that's what I do to relax. I love to cook, and so I have this special wing recipe. And uh, I'm gonna have to bring you guys out some uh, sometime so y'all can taste them. And yes, so I, I love to cook uh, wings, greens, and fried cabbage. That's my specialty. Now you grow some of your own stuff. Uh, we too. do. Yes. We do. BMW has its own garden that's located at First Baptist. Church Bracktown, where we meet. We're blessed to have a young man that works at Kentucky State by the name of Dr. Marcus Bernard. Uh, and so he helps our young men uh, to grow the vegetables and things there. One, one year we did a project where the young men grew the tomatoes, they grew the peppers and everything. So we had one group to grow everything. We had another group to harvest it. And then we brought a chef in who taught him to make salsa. And then we had a marketing group. And then we actually sold the salsa. So they got to see it from the seed to a product that you could actually full say circle. A full circle that they got to see all of that. And so we, we just, you know, here's my motto for education. Anything you learn with pleasure, you never forget. And mm -hmm. so that's what I'm doing. I'm having a ball uh, and teaching these young men, working with these young men, sharing with these families. And as I say, I'm walking in my purpose that I know God has called me to do. Oh, I have so enjoyed learning from you and listening and chatting with you today. Thank you for having me. But I want to give you the last word for any young girls or young women that might be watching okay. and looking at Roz and saying, Roz is doing all of these great things. What can I do? Any words of advice that you might want to give? Let, let, me, say, let me say this, that don't ever take no for an answer, <laughs> that if you believe that you've been called to do something, you, you're going to have some ups and some downs and some things like that, but you stick with it. You believe in what you've been called to do. Don't let anybody, you know, defeat your purpose. Don't in, let anybody say you cannot do that. You have to press through. You have to push through. And then you believe in what you've been called to do. And the reward comes 
at a later date. We live in a time where everybody wants everything to be done in an instant. You can't do instant mm -hmm. when you've been having a special calling on your life. So don't ever give up. Continue to pray. Steady the course and you'll get your reward. You guys have heard it from Roz Akins. Do not ever get up. Steady the course and you will get your reward. Continue to join us as we celebrate other phenomenal women in Kentucky, just like Roz, who are making a difference and strengthening the community. I'll see you next time.